I see you all here excited to start this lesson on acceleration. Well, I have to warn you that this is a continuation from the last lesson. So those of you who missed out last lesson, you have to go back there and catch up right now. Exit and go back there and see that first because like you can't watch part two without part one because I'm going to say so many things that are related to part one which may, may be lost. You may become lost because of not having that information. So if you are here without having watched the previous part, unless you are like me, expert at physics, then you may not even need to be here. But you are here because you're somebody forced you, right? Okay, I did. Okay, so let's start acceleration and we continue with another graph similar to the last part where we had a graph, but that was displacement over here. Okay, so now we are changing it to velocity. So let me start with a short intro. When you have displacement time graph, okay, and you take the gradient, you will get velocity out of that gradient. So you get all the velocities from the displacement time graph. Okay, so maybe I should say graph. Now, if you get the velocities and you plot them like this below, this is called a velocity time graph. And you take its gradient at any point. For example, you could take a gradient of this line and you should get, hopefully, you will get acceleration. Okay? An interesting part to that also is because this displacement is in meters. Therefore, this velocity becomes meters per second because it's the rate. Remember, the rate of change of this guy becomes that guy. So there's a per second. And then, this guy is already with a per second and acceleration is the rate of that guy. So rate of velocity is you take that guy, you give him a rate again, it becomes meters per second per second. Because every time you take the gradient, you are dividing it by second because it's over time, which also because it's the rate of change. So now you already start with meters per second. And then you're going to take the gradient, which then you divide by the second again, which is over here. So you're going to get meters per second per second. And that's exactly where we get our meters per second squared. For those of you who may have been wondering, how come there's a very unique formula with a square over there? Because all this while we only know without square, kilometers per hour, meters per second, and so on. Now, acceleration is that unique, right? So, because you have done two rows of gradients, you've gotten from displacement and then gotten velocity, from velocity you get a gradient again. So, if you are given just velocity, then it's good because you're given the second stage here. That's why this is part two of the lesson. Part one we did in the first part before this. So, green we're not going to do today. We're going to do the yellow color. Yellow color, which means all the velocities are already plotted and then we can derive acceleration by checking the gradients. So the first gradient from A to B is going to be pretty easy, right? Just do that and do that. So how many meters is this? I would say it's about 15 meters per second. Now it's not meters, it's meters per second. And how quickly did the car or this object move from 0 to 15? Very quickly, within I would say this is about two seconds. So my acceleration will be 15 divided by two. Therefore, meters per second divided by second is meters per second per second. So it's an acceleration. So it's 15 divided by two is 7.5. So therefore, my acceleration here equals to 7.5 meters per second squared. That's how I get my first acceleration by taking the gradient. Can I get the gradient here? Yes, I can. So, I will do that. And this is 5 meters per second. Why? Now, we can remember we, in the last lesson we introduced, A is final velocity minus initial velocity because not all the initial velocity is at zero. It could be from B to C, 
his initial velocity was 15, his final velocity was 20. So therefore, is actually final velocity is 20, initial velocity is 15, therefore you will get a 5. That's why I put the 5 there. The time taken for this is I have to go down and see it's about 5 seconds. But it's the rate of change of time as well. Okay? Because this is rate of change of velocity, V minus U. Rate of change of time is also the T2 minus T1. You'll be making a big mistake if you put 5 there. It should be 5 minus 2 because he changed from this point to this point B to C is only within 3 seconds. 5 minus 2. So 5 minus 2. So that's 3 seconds. So I've got 5 divided by 3. 5 over 3 meters per second square is the acceleration for this. Now between this and this, which has a higher acceleration? There are two straight lines, so it's easy to find out which has a higher acceleration compared to curves which are coming there, coming fast ahead. Okay, but we are going to look at these two first so that we understand the basics. So now, this slope or this slope, which is gentle, which is steep? This is steep, this is gentle, right? So that's why this steep slope has a high value, 7.5, and this gentle slope has a value of 1. I would say 7 or something. It's not 2 yet because or 1.8 or something. Okay, I'm just giving you an estimate, but you can see the difference in the numbers. 1 being gentle and 7 being steep. So we are asking you which of the gradients are steeper? The A to B. Which of the acceleration is higher? A to B. So acceleration is tagged to the gradient as well. So this is a confirmation again. So let's move on and just read the graph further after A, B, C, D. Well, what's happening from C to D? The speed is constant. No change. That means he is not moving, right? 20 meters per second all the way. No, he's not moving. No, he is. He is that in the distance displacement and distance time graph when it's a straight line, he's not moving because it shows meters. Now it shows meters per second. That means he was traveling at 20 meters per second, 20 meters per second, 20 meters per second. For about five seconds, he was traveling at constant velocity. So this part is constant velocity, which is equals to 20 meters per second. Here the velocity is changing. Okay, but constantly. Okay, so it's accelerating. Velocity is changing here, velocity is not changing, so it's accelerating. Right? So A and A, B to B, C is all accelerating. And then here, constant velocity means divide 20 minus 20 over time taken is 5 seconds. It still gives you zero. So acceleration is actually zero meters per second squared. Can you see? So here, acceleration is zero. That's a difference. Here is acceleration was 7.5. Here was acceleration was one point something. Here the acceleration is zero. So it's not accelerating because he's going at constant speed. Okay. So these are the three segments we have segmented already up to D. Let's look at the more challenging looking ones. Wow, that really looks like a, what, a valley maybe? Let's look at the valley. So I've actually covered all these points. You can read it. So now we're going to the valley section. After D, what happens? From D to E, D to E, the velocity decreases from 20 to 5. Again, it's actually a straight line, but we are changing. We're given two increasing lines. One constant velocity, zero acceleration. Now negative. Why? How do you get negative? Let's see. A equals to V minus U over T. Final velocity is here. We're going to take these two points. Final velocity is 5. Initial velocity is 20 over the time taken is 3 seconds. So this is 3. That means 13. Alright. Now, how much is that? 15 
divide by 3. Is it just 15 or minus 15? So it's minus 5 meters per second squared. Can you see now the negative value comes in? My acceleration is calculated as negative because the slope is negative. These are positive slopes. These are negative slopes. A number of the gradient must show whether your gradient you calculated on a positive slope or a negative slope. Otherwise, it's a meaningless exercise to do gradients. So when your gradient is negative, it shows clearly your line is also negatively sloped. But the number will show whether it's very steep or very gentle. So this is pretty steep as well. Maybe not as steep as this guy. His number is 7. His number is 5 but negative. So you can say he's accelerating at minus 5 meters per second or you can also say the other word that you learned is decelerating which is the opposite of accelerating. So we got to put this info combined together, right? Accelerating, accelerating, no acceleration, decelerating, slowing down. Why? He was going at very fast speed and then 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, and drops all the way to 5. And he did that in just 3 seconds. Zoom! Slow down. And that speed of change of velocity or the rate of change of velocity is minus 5. Okay? So I have done the calculation both on the board and also given you the description here. You can read both and understand better. Next part, finish E, now E to F. E to F shows a gentle curvature. It's curved now, not straight anymore. I can't find any straight lines. It's curving, so I have to find maybe the slope, maybe here is still straight, but here the slope is going this way, and then finally the slope is going this way. So can you see, I can see three different slopes. One, two, three. From just E to F, one, two, three. So, Steep, not so steep, gentle to zero slope. This one is considered no slope, same as here. So no slope is zero acceleration. So he's not speeding and also at the same time, his velocity also dropped to zero. So at that, at that point of time, at this instant, he's actually stopping for a, mo for a moment, zero speed. So at F, he actually stops for a while because remember, he was at 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13 and blah, 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 blah. And zero so he stops at f so shows a decreasing concave and therefore a non-uniform deceleration so this is considered not a uniform earlier is uniform steady deceleration this one is non-uniform which means it's more difficult to calculate the value unless you are told at which point you want to calculate the value and then you will do a tangent right so you can do a tangent and my tangent lines are over there you can pick at any point of time you want this time this time this time you can do a acceleration calculation of course if I did it at this time my acceleration will end up to be zero so I just say acceleration is zero there that's fine and then it comes to a stop so we are done with F so let's go on after that he stops and he starts again starts again speeding up but this time He's actually at the same point as here, like he was zero, right? Zero. So your motorbike, your zero is, is con completely stopped. But here, within two seconds, he goes to 15 at a constant speed. Here is not. He's a bit slow first, then he speeds up. A bit slow first, then he speeds up. So can you see the slope here? The acceleration is slow first, then here, then here. Now, this is the opposite to the other side. So when you have a curve like that, here you have a slope that is becoming gentle. Here you have a slope that is becoming steeper to go up, upwards. And of course, this is easy. This part is slightly different. So what happens is gentle, steeper, steeper. Then he go gentle again. That means he's changing again. So there are a few things that you can say about this. So let's talk about the green part first. It is accelerating. We're not decelerating anymore. So can you imagine the words that I'm using. Anything that goes down, I decelerate. Anything that goes up, I accelerate. Anything that's constant, we zero acceleration. So it is accelerating, but it is increasing. Why increasing? Because of the slope. In the exam, 
when they ask to find this increasing or decreasing, put a few slopes. You can see the slope moving from gentle to steep. That means it's increasing. However, for the yellow one, it's from steep to gentle. So this part, the yellow part is actually accelerating still, but decreasing. All right, so this part from the steep to gentle. So you can consider the G and the H part. So ex decreasing acceleration. So these are the key things that you pick up today. You need to know how to do curving velocity time graphs and pick out the acceleration because this is very common. They will ask you, is it accelerating or decelerating? It's very easy because going down, going up. But is it decreasing acceleration, decreasing, increasing acceleration, decreasing deceleration, and so on and so forth? You need to be able to pick it up, okay? But based on the slope. So you just keep drawing the slope. Is, if you want to find from here to here the acceleration, is it increasing or decreasing? You can see from the slope. From here to here, is it increasing or decreasing? You can see from the slope, okay? And then finally, H to I is just a deceleration he wants to completely stop so he goes straight down to zero within uh, maybe three three seconds all right so when an object moves at constant velocity it means neither its speed nor its direction is changing this is constant velocity okay but constant velocity means neither its speed nor its direction is changing why velocity you have to include this direction aspect as well so very important now, to calculate the displacement of the object in the first 10 seconds, we can actually calculate the displacement of the object in the whole 30 seconds, which means you need to calculate the area under the graph. Now, we know how big a challenge it is to actually calculate area under this graph. So, in the exams, we will give you the easiest possible option with a few triangles, uh, rectangles, squares, and even trapeziums, so that you may be able to calculate that. So now, they said first 10 seconds only. So first 10 seconds will be just here. Take this area, and that will give you displacement. Okay, that's exactly what's written down here as well. Can you calculate area? can looks difficult but break it up okay break it up how do you break it up let me show you let's do it together Ta -da -ta 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 -ta. okay now we break it up now we have this and then we have this Okay, my lines are not straight, but you can always find the area of this triangle, half base times A, half base times height, and this is a rectangle, and this in between is a trapezium. How do you do a trapezium? You do half multiplied by the two parallel sides multiplied by the single perpendicular side, which is, what does that mean? The two parallel sides are, let me take the red color. The two parallel sides are this, 15 and 20. So I put 15, but you must add them. And then the single, this was, remember it was 3. So I put 3. And then you do the area of a trapezium. Of course, the other two are easy. Then you add them up. So you take the area, take the area, take the area. Well, if you don't want to do that, you can always break it up in another trapezium or triangles up like putting a line here which I don't want to do now because that will just make this whole thing messy but I can draw a line straight through here and then you get one trapezium here and then you got one square here and you got one triangle here it's also three parts so break it up into whatever part you're comfortable you should get the same answer okay that's easy so remember how to do displacement for area under the graph it comes from the velocity time graph all right now, when an object falls due to gravity, now, we talked about the object just now traveling. Most of it, we talk about it on the road because we say the speed. But did we consider any object? Was that object actually traveling through air, like maybe falling from a building? If it was, 
then something else can come into play, which is air resistance. Of course, even when it's traveling on the road, there's air resistance, there's friction, because you have contact with the road. When you're traveling fast, the air resistance also takes place. So what am I trying to say? For example, you have a car. A car just doesn't float, it actually has contact. So if you are trying to travel, you will have frictional force that is opposing your motion can reduce your speed. And then as you travel faster and faster, the air that will, you will experience is called the air friction or air resistance. That can also slow you down. Can you imagine you're traveling very fast and you can feel the air trying to push you back? The faster you go, the more air tries to push you back. Okay, that's an equal and opposite force. Okay, so this air resistance and friction together can work to reduce your speed. No matter how fast you're trying to go, your car will say, I want to go at 80, but these two will reduce to 60. So your car actually shows, oh, I can't, I'm only going at 60 kilometers per hour and so forth. Now, so you can consider this air resistance when it comes to what? Calculating your velocity and so on and so forth when you plot the graph. So especially when you drop a ball from, or in any object from the sky, you definitely have to include the air resistance because the faster it drops, the more the equal and opposite air resistance will react. And in this case, there is no friction. So therefore, there's only air resistance to consider. Therefore, air resistance becomes a very integral part of any falling object through air. Whereas uh, any object going through the ground may have friction and air resistance, so it's a combined effort. But for anything that is falling, you need a air resistance. So what happens when a parachute is fall, is, falls down? Remember? Initially, he falls very fast, then after some time, he reaches a common velocity, which we call it terminal velocity. Have you heard of this term, terminal velocity? So we're going to have terminal velocity explained now. How does terminal velocity come about? Okay, it's also a very important part of this topic, so we're going to cover that in detail right now.